Well, good morning, everybody. Hey, great to be with you here at St. James. So glad you, you came to worship with us today. I've got a, uh, a few slides we're going to start off with. I want you to see. I saw them and I thought, yeah, they, this will be good to show to our, uh, to our crowd on, on Sunday morning. So this is a paperweight, a picture of a paperweight that a buddy of mine who's a prayer partner um, down in Eatonton sent me. And this is what he has on his desk. And as you'll see there, it says... Um, if you can read it, God promises a safe landing, not a calm passage. Now, that's true, isn't it? You know, he's going to get us to heaven, um, but wow, it's going to be choppy water sometime, not so smooth sailing along the way. Um, so, yeah, not always a calm passage. Okay, this next one. I, I really like this next one. Okay, um, it's coming. It is. It's in there. There we go. Okay, so look at this. Look at this. Pharaoh goes to the doctor. So he's got a few, uh, he's got a few sores that are broken out all over his body. <laughs> Y'all, there is a lot of truth to that. Okay, that's really relevant in our days, if, if y'all know what I'm talking about. I mean, whoo, wow. Uh, yeah, let my people go. My goodness. <laughs> Let let us go. Okay, next one. Um, okay, so this is a little bit of a callback. You know that um, in our sermon series here, you'll see even today that uh, I've got this map here. That's right, of the seven churches that are on here. And uh, we did this about four weeks ago. We've been having this run in our bulletin every single week, just showing you the different churches that we are covering among the seven churches of Revelation that God was writing a letter to back then through the Apostle John as he was in prison on an island in the Mediterranean called Patmos. And so Jesus appeared to him, gave him this tremendous vision, and John wrote it all down. And then when he got off the island, amazingly, um, then that letter, the book of Revelation, was sent out to all these different churches. And so this is an illustration of where these churches are located today in present-day Turkey. So Brian is holding here, that's right, a map of Turkey. And some of you all know what's coming next, because about four weeks ago he did this. And so he folded the map up. Yes, he put it between two pieces of bread and made a turkey sandwich. Yes, that's right. The 9 o'clock crowd was like, oh my gosh, wow, I can't believe that. So I, that's very humorous, Brian. You did a good job. Yeah, you did really, really well, man. Thank you for that. All right, friends, well, we're going to continue on here. So looking here in the scripture, keep your Bibles open, please, because I'll be referring back to this from Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. So these are Jesus' words, and he's talking to John. He's saying, write this down. But notice who it's addressed to. It's not addressed not only to the church that is in Sardis, but he says to the angel of the church in Sardis. So pretty cool here in, the, in these two chapters, of chapter 2 and chapter 3, Jesus is addressing these seven churches, but he begins, he leads off with, to the angel in Philadelphia, to the angel in Ephesus. So each church has a guardian angel. Gosh, I can't wait to see when I get to heaven one day what the guardian angel of St. James looks like. You know, I don't know if his name is Mo or Larry or Curly. I'm not sure, um, but I tell you this. Um, I would not want to get in an arm wrestling match with that guy at all. Um, I'll talk about that in just a moment. But first of all, uh, these are the words to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? Let's talk about Sardis because that's who Jesus is addressing here. Um, so Sardis was a very wealthy city back then. In fact, they were the first ones to mint in their region to mint gold and silver coins. So they, they recognized themselves as having a lot of money and they felt pretty proud and pretty secure about that. Um, also, geographically, they were positioned in a, in a pretty unique area because they were way up on top of a mountain. And this mountain was just naturally well fortified because it rose about 1,500 feet up and the sides, it was actually surrounded on three sides by these rock walls that were kind of defending it. And the walls were almost perpendicular, um, almost at a 90 degree angle. 
Um, and the thing about it is if you try to climb up these walls, these rock walls, if you're an invader with an opposing force, what you would find is, is that the rock was very, very treacherous because it was loose rock. And so you could get part of the way up, but then slip or fall all the way down hundreds of feet. So it was a dicey proposition to even try to capture it. So they were protecting this way. And then on the one open level, um, the, the fourth area, I guess, to have access to the... Um, to this fortress, it was really well guarded by some very strong gates and a castle-like fortress that was built up around the city. Now, I say all that because of this. The city felt really, really, the people felt um, very, very safe there. They, they actually had a false sense of security that they would never be captured. Now, these people who lived in Sardis actually had short memories. Because twice in their history, they had been captured, they had been penetrated, and what happened on both occasions is, like a couple hundred years before this, was that there was a band of 15 raiders that crept up in the middle of the night. They got into a crevice in the rock wall, and they scaled all the way up, they got up without falling all the way to the very top. They got over the wall of the castle. And then once they did, they just started walking around. And it was just real easy just to kind of sashay right on over to the city gate and open it up. And then all of a sudden, whoom, all their forces came in and took everybody by surprise because they were sleeping. They didn't even have guards stationed there at night to protect them because they thought that nobody can get in. We're safe. So even the guards were horizontal. Even the guard's head was one of, on one of Mike Lindell's pillows. That's right. Um, and, and, and so they were, they were sound asleep. And that's a good description of this church in Sardis. We'll get back to that. These are the words of him. So this is Jesus saying this. These are my words who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, the stars, we talked about this a few weeks ago. The stars are angels. Stars are metaphors for these angels. Um, and so I told you that each one, uh, each church has this guardian angel. So St. James is guardian angel. You know, the Bible says that angels are much bigger and stronger than we are. Um, Never met this angel before, never seen him in a vision, um, but you would not want to get into an arm wrestling match with this guy, I promise you, because it would be an L for the day. I mean, he would take you, and he wouldn't just simply take your fist down to the table. He could take it through the table, and then, bam, wood splinters would fly everywhere. So the Bible says that Jesus holds the seven stars in his hand. That means the angels of these churches. That also means the billions of angels that he created that are in heaven. And so God is revealing to us, every angel is underneath my control. Jesus is. That's how powerful he is. Next, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God. Now this is referring actually to the Holy Spirit. doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is made up of these six or seven angels individual spirits. Another way of looking at this, another phrase to describe the Holy Spirit is the sevenfold spirit of God. Here's what that means. In Judaism, numbers carry weight. They have a, a certain meaning to them. And so in, in Judaism, the number seven means fullness or, or completeness. So what God is telling us here is that if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit that I put inside of you, he is completely able to take care of your every single need. He's completely sufficient. When you're freaking out taking a test and it's like, oh my gosh, God, I don't have enough, I don't have enough hours in the night now to study for this. My test is coming up at 8 o'clock. The Holy Spirit is completely good to hear your anxiety and trustworthy to take these concerns that you have and help you through any challenge that you face. He's fully present at all times. You never have to pray 
ever, the most useless prayer we can pray is, hey God, would you come and be with me now? As though he's 500 million miles away. No, if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit is inside of you. Your life is his zip code. He's right here. All you got to do is say, Holy Spirit, help me. And he'll do that. He's full of power. He's full of intelligence. Do you realize the Holy Spirit sees your life? Not only where you've been, completely backwards, but he also sees your life forwards. Everything that you're going to do between now and then on a 360 degree level. So, knowing that Jesus has his Holy Spirit in his hand, what he's put in your life, that ought to just help us to exhale and say, God's got this. Doesn't feel like it, but God's got this. Jesus continues, I know your deeds. You have a reputation. He's speaking to the church of Sardis, right? I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, he says. Do any of y'all like sardines? Okay, you know, there, I didn't get many takers at the 9 o'clock service either. I had a couple people raise their hand. One guy surprised me. He's like, you like sardines? And uh, my dad used to love sardines. I have memories of him on Sunday night. Called it trash night. This is where you'd kind of go to the refrigerator and you get all, finds all kinds of trash that's in there, leftovers, you know, and you're just heating them up. Well, Dad wouldn't do that. He'd go get a can of sardines. Ugh, so gross. And he would rip the top off of it. And they would, those sardines would all be stacked in there uh, in the oil. And this smells just this pungent smell coming from a can of sardines. Now, what you'll never find is when you open a can of sardines, you're not going to find them flip-flopping around there in the can, um, you know, trying to swim to get out. Okay, they're all dead, okay? They're all lifeless. And so I like the way that um, a guy by the name of Ed Love, who wrote a commentary about this, he called this the Church of Sardis, the Church of the Sardines. (laughs) Because they were totally dead to God. I mean, they were just completely lifeless. It's interesting about this church. See, this church was the kind that was more concerned about appearances, how they looked to people rather than how they lived to God. They would have gone to church at 11 11 a.m. sharp and exited at 12 o'clock dull. Totally asleep. See, they would have gone, this was the, this, these are the kind of people who would have gone through the motions and they were Christians basically just in name only. They had leaves on their tree but, but no spiritual fruit and so they were comatose in their relationship with him and so Jesus Jesus was like wake up please wake up because Jesus could sense danger was coming they were in a very very perilous position and I love this about God because it's not hard for us to get in this position where we're just the church of the living dead where we're just simply sleepwalking even if everybody else is awake for us to be fast asleep and here's how we can so easily fall into this trap it's one of three ways one is um, is that we we fail we become numb to God and we just we're just lifeless in our walk with God when we fail to take sin seriously when we just don't treat it as a big deal, we, we don't, when we do something wrong, we're not running to God saying, God, would you, would you have mercy? I messed up again, would you forgive me? See, when you, when you don't do that, when you're not living that way and asking God to kind of clean your heart, then all of a sudden you become dull to the Lord. Um, it's kind of like an example of this is like um, our sins are like a moon on a solar eclipse. Y'all ever seen a solar eclipse? We had one a few years ago. You know, if you've actually seen one, we had a pretty good one several years ago. Um, and, and the moon will come, it will just start blocking the face of the sun, right? It, the moon comes between the orbit of Earth and the sun, and all of a sudden it starts coming, 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 and it completely, at times, it will completely block out the light of the sun. Well, that's what our sins do. They'll, they'll block out the presence of Jesus to us and all of a sudden we're in the dark. 
So the sins are like a moon on a solar eclipse. So that will make you sleepy. You don't take your sins seriously. That's one way that we can become like the church of the sardines. Second way is, is that um, we get trapped in a self-absorbed lifestyle where life is just all about us. It's what my job I'm doing, my classes that I'm taking, my career that I'm building for myself, my girlfriend, my boyfriend, whatever it may be, it's all about me, 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 me. And then when, you, when that happens, when you get trapped in that, um, you know, all of a sudden you're just totally disconnected from what God is doing all around you. That makes you asleep to God. A third way is not only when we just basically are we're um, stuck on self or we're, we're just saying all oh, this, this kind of sin stuff. It's just not that big of a deal, too. Number three is, and this is a, this is a scary one because this one is real easy to, to get, get um, seduced by. We become so busy doing things for God that we spend less and less time with God. I mean, it, it's frightening how easy this one can happen. I, I was uh, speaking, I remember, um, it, was a, it was a few years ago, there was a, a leader here at St. James, and, and he's no longer here now, but, but a leader, and, and he was, um, I noticed when he was in ministry, he, he looked really agitated one day. And, and so I took him out to eat lunch, and I said, hey, you know, what's going on? And then all of a sudden, oh, my gosh, he just started just spilling everything. He just started complaining about, you know, his brothers and sisters in Christ. He started just bemoaning all the things. They are not doing this, or they are not doing this. And he was just hypercritical, and he was just very, very angry. Um, and it, but, but there was just a, a darkness just around him. It just seemed unusual. And so he just continued on like this for about, literally for about 45 minutes. My, my ears started getting, started hurting because I was just hearing so much. It's like, man, I'm, I don't know how much more of this I can take. And then all of a sudden I just stopped him and I said, hey, listen, can, can I ask you a question? I said, this is going to seem a little like it's out of left field. I said, but just go with it. I said, how's your prayer time with God? And all of a sudden he stopped talking. And it became real quiet in his truck. And he just, he said, I don't have one. He said, it's gone. And you never would have known it had you seen him around church because he was so busy doing a lot of things for God. But slowly through time, this guy who's a Christian, who, loved, who did love the Lord, he had just, he replaced the relationship with just activity. And he just forgot about, he went to sleep on Jesus. And so Jesus was saying to him, wake up, wake up. And so in light of that, I want to show you this, this picture on the screen. This is something I do. See, I can become like that very easily. So can you, by the way. So can you. And so, you know, we have to put ourselves in these places where we are being nurtured in the faith and we are going to Bible studies, we're going to small groups, and, and we're even doing morning devotions, whatever it takes to get us connected and stay connected to the vine, right, to Jesus. And so this is something that's real easy. I've told you some of you about this, and uh, I just highly, highly recommend it. It's the best devotional series I've ever um, been a part of or actually um, been connected to. I'm not the moderator. It's actually a guy who I went to seminary with. But you can find this on seedbed.com, and this is so easy. You can get these morning devotions emailed to your box. You can read them, or you can simply click on where it has a little audio button. Click on that, and I listen to it every morning when I come to church just to make it real, real easy to get the Word of God in my life. And so um, you go to seedbed.com, and right there on the main page, it says Wake Up Call. Now, y'all, this is how easy it is. All you got to do is punch in your, type in your first name, 
your last name and your email, and best of all, they don't give your email address to Amazon. They don't give it to Kmart, they don't give it to Walmart, so you're not going to be hounded, okay, because of that. They're not going to sell it to anybody. But um, what J.D. Walt does every morning is in, he starts the devotion by reading Ephesians 5.14. He has the, the seedbed listeners, and there's about 35,000 of us. Um, and what he'll do is he'll go to Ephesians 5.14, and so he starts off with his verse, which says, Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So wake up. And so I say this out loud because I know I can fall asleep to God. So will you say this with me? Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So Jesus is telling the, these people here in Revelation to the church of the sardines. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Now, um, one thing to understand is, is that, and let me just make sure I say this so that you're not confused, you are never saved by what you do in ministry, ever. Won't happen. Doesn't matter how much good you do. You are not, that's not going to be what gets you to heaven. Um, if you love God, though, really love God, no one will be able to hold you back from doing the things you'll want to do in ministry. To say, Jesus, I'm so grateful. Man, I'm so grateful you went to the cross when you didn't have to. That's what our service is. It's a, it's a thank you to God. So, the church of Sardis was failing in its mission, and Jesus was highlighting that. He's saying, listen, you know, the, the faith that was there is no longer there, it's dying. And because of that, there's no fruit in your life in terms of how you're serving. See, what you'll notice is, if you read the, this letter closely, the other churches were persecuted because of their faith. But notice here in Sardis, they weren't persecuted at all. Do you know why? It's because they weren't a threat to Satan. Satan loved the, the place they were in because they were dead to God. God or let me say it another way, God was dead to them. Um, and so this was a church that wasn't fighting evil. They weren't conforming their lives to Scripture. They weren't, um, their praise band was not up here. Their praise band may have been performing to get the applause of the people. They weren't worshiping God. They weren't the lead worshipers. They weren't alive to God. They weren't bringing people to Jesus. They weren't feeding poor people like we do at City of Refuge. They were just so stuck on self. So, think about what our mission is here at St. James. Um, I want you to get your bulletin and read this. Let's see, my bulletin... Get this stuff lost up here. Anyway, I know what's on the front of it. You look at the front of it, okay? Um, we always have every single week our mission, the mission of our church that is printed here on the front of the bulletin. And remember, it's highlighted by two words in particular, two action words that begin with E. What are the two words? Engage and equip. Hey, that's good. I see a lot of you weren't even looking down when y'all said that. That means that, it, that it's really sticking to your soul. Man, that, that makes a happy minister. Okay, so... Now, let's recite together what our mission statement is. We are to engage our community with the good news of Jesus, that's good, and equip believers to become devoted followers of Christ. Wow, that's, that's, that's sticking, that's going. So let me show you about how we always want to be in ministry uh, doing these two things. Um, I try to give you good examples. Engage our community with the good news of Jesus. Your community is wherever God puts you in that moment. If you're out at the equestrian fields, you know, and you're watching the horses jump, that's your community in that moment. Or if you're out in the soccer field, or when you're at work, uh, when you're at the gym, wherever you go, or whenever you're getting your hair done, you know, 
That's your community where you are. So engage our community with the good news of Jesus. Y'all, it is, it is so much easier than we make it out to be. We get so scared and thinking like, I'm not a Billy Graham. I can't lead people to Christ. You're not called to save people. You're called to just simply say, tell another person, hey, I got to tell you what Jesus did for me last Friday night. It was pretty cool. You just share with them real quick. 30-second story. Boom, there you go. I, I like what uh, Tim Crow has done. I, I'll use him as an example. Thank you, Tim, for this. Um, Tim, uh, he and his wife, they, they've been fighting a health scare in their family for about five years, and so um, his wife, Deb, uh, she was recently down at uh, Emory Hospital in Atlanta for a couple weeks because she was having some serious treatments down there. And while she was down there getting her blood tests and everything, there were moments, and Tim was right there. He's such a faithful husband. He was by her side. He was with her for two whole weeks. And so during the downtimes when she might be taken down uh, for x-rays or whatever, Tim was just, you know, there. Well, instead of just simply, you know, just catching some sleep, and that would have been fine to do that, you know what Tim did? Tim started engaging his community with the good news of Jesus. So where was he? He was at Emory Hospital. So what he did was he took something simple, a picture that he had seen that kind of uh, grabbed his heart one time, a painting up on a wall of Jesus holding some lambs. And so he took that and just in a very simple fashion, he just drew it out on a sheet of paper uh, freehand, and then he connected Isaiah 40, 11 to it. So um, Isaiah 40, 11 says this. This is a prophecy that was about Jesus that was written 700 years before he came to this world. And here's what it says about Christ. Isaiah 40, 11, that he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arm and carries them close to his heart. So Tim kind of took that, he, he drew that picture there, very, very simple picture. We've got some of these over here on the altar rail. When you leave, when you, if you want to pick one up on your way out. Um, but he put the verse right here, and he started handing these out to nurses, to health care workers there at Emory. I think he gave out every one that he had, about 90 of them. And Tim said that a lot of the nurses that he gave them to, he noticed they would kind of pin them up, tape them to their computer. They'd put them in their cubby hole where they could see it, so that when they were there, exhausted after an 11-hour shift and they had one more hour to go, they could look at that picture and remember, you know what? I need to give this patient my best because Jesus is holding them close to his heart. So a real simple way, and by the way, Tim was also, when, he, when he'd be handing these out, he would tell the folks the fact that, you know what, there were hundreds of prophecies written about the Messiah and about the statistical improbability of any one person ever, ever fulfilling them. But he says, Jesus did. And he gives it to them. See, it's that simple. Engaging your community with the good news of Jesus. That's how we do it. And by the way, when we take the stuff that we do wrong seriously, and, and when we don't just simply look at self, but we focus on the needs of other people, you know, and we also, we are in service to others, engaging them. Guess what happens, friends? It keeps us alive by the power of the Holy Spirit, so that we don't fall asleep and Jesus is not having to tell us, wake up, wake up. Now, um, I am going to land this plane in, in not too long of a fashion. Look here at chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 5. Jesus continues, the one who is victorious, like them, will be dressed in white. That means his righteousness is on your life. Your sins are forgiven. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name. That means your name, by the way, if you're a believer. But will acknowledge that name before my Father in heaven and his angels. So I want you to understand something. Jesus recognizes you even when you don't realize it. And he's singling out people here. He's not talking about, he's talking about people who please him, but he's not referring to perfect people because none of us are. 
He's just simply looking for people who are perfectly forgiven. That's who he wants to be in his faithful family, okay? And, and so here's, here's what makes that easy is my, Micah 6, 8. You want to know, know what a faithful lifestyle as a believer looks like? Micah 6, 8 says it. Act justly, love mercy, give mercy to others, and walk humbly with God. And Christ says, I will never blot out your name from the book of life, but will acknowledge your name. You know, there's an old hymn. Uh, Gretchen, you've probably sung it maybe 5,000 times. Uh, stand up, stand up for Jesus, right? We will sing that. Stand up for Jesus. Well, you know what? Jesus stands up for you. You don't understand how shocking that is, do you? You may be in a place where you just don't think of God very much. But you know what? God thought of you billions of years ago, enough about you to write your name down in this special book, saying, I choose you for heaven. And Jesus says, if you live by faith in me, your name will stay there forever. I want you to be in my family. We're going to have uh, some altar ministry here in just a moment, and there are going to be a couple of prayer ministers. If you don't know Christ, and you've never gotten to a relationship with him, today's the perfect day to do that. What do you have to lose? It's the best decision you'll ever make. Just come down and say, hey, listen, I'm ready to become a Christian. I'm ready to follow Jesus and commit myself to him do that during our prayer time um, if you have any other kind of need our prayer ministers here but you need to understand some God stands up for you you know you look at the book of Acts in chapter 7 um, Stephen is preaching just minutes before he's going to be stoned minutes before his death and all of a sudden he saw heaven and guess what he saw in heaven he saw Jesus standing up there looking at him Christ was standing up for Stephen. There in the book of Genesis, Jacob is sleeping in the desert in the Old Testament. He's asleep, and what does he see? He sees a staircase with angels walking on it. And who's at the top of the staircase but God? And God is standing up looking at him. Listen, on Judgment Day, your sins are going to cry out against you. For damnation. The devil may be pointing at you with an accusing finger. Accusing you and accusing you and accusing you. But Jesus is going to stand up and say, Father, that one's mine. They're forgiven. They're mine. And all those accusations will fall dead in the ground. So Jesus is talking to us today and he's saying, wake up, wake up, wake up to me because I give you the very breath that you breathe. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is done.